Thanks, everybody, for joining us for uh, this bug bounty panel. Thanks to OWASP for having us uh, here today to talk, talk with all of you, a, a nice full crowd here. Uh, thanks, everybody. So my name is Sean Martin. I'm the editor-in-chief for ITSP Magazine. Our publication is uh, all about covering the stories at the intersection of IT security and society. So I encourage you to, uh, to look at some of the stories that we capture there. And today, obviously, we're going to be talking about bug bounties. And uh, as your moderator, I'll be looking at uh, the panel here, which I'll introduce in a second. We're going to look at how bug bounties are run, some of the challenges uh, companies might face, uh, what incentivizes researchers, pros and cons of different types of, of uh, models. And, uh, and then we'll look at some attributes, possibly, of what companies what types of companies would benefit from a bug bounty program. So uh, quickly, just so I'm not here standing by myself talking forever, I'd like to introduce the panel because they're the experts on this topic. Uh, to my immediate left is Michael Gallagher from PayPal, uh, Cassio Goldschmidt from Stroh's Friedberg, Sean Melia from Digital Gothic, Gotham, Gotham Science. Digital Science. Yep. Gotham yeah. Digital Science, sorry. And uh, Mike Stoker from Baker McKenzie. So gentlemen, if you could please, uh, just a brief introduction for yourself and your company so the folks know who, who they have with them today. I'll start with you. Michael. So I'm Michael Gallagher. I'm the senior manager at PayPal. I manage all of the application operations type um, functions. So think penetration testing, bug bounty, all of our <coughs> continuous production scanning, the application vulnerability lifecycle, and root cause analysis. Cassie. I'm Cassie Goldschmidt. I work for Strauss Freeburg as a vice president in the proactive service part of the uh, practice. And uh, I help companies to actually get up to speed and create their bug bounty programs where they are, whenever they are ready. I'm Sean Melia. I'm a senior security engineer at Gotham Digital Science. And I partake in a lot of bug bounties, mainly on the HackerOne platform, where I'm ranked uh, one of the top hackers. And I'm Mike Stoker. I'm a partner in the global law firm of Baker & McKenzie. I work in the Chicago office, and I'm in the privacy and technology practice. So part of my practice is advising companies on things like bug bounty programs, data security breaches, and other related issues. Perfect. So a nice round of uh, different viewpoints here. So great, great uh, conversation ahead of us. Uh, I was hoping for a few more people to get some interesting numbers here, but I'm, I'm curious just from the audience, uh, who of you are familiar with bug bounties at this point? So everybody's pretty much familiar with them, so I don't have to go into too much detail, which is good. Um, how many of you are actually running a program at your company? Two-fifths, roughly, nearly half. Um, one might argue, we were having a conversation last night, uh, one might argue you're running, most companies are probably running a bug bounty program, they just don't know it. It's just a matter of time before <laughs> that researcher comes to them with a request for payment, right? Um, and actually, I, I did some research uh, preparing for this, and I reached out to a number of different folks uh, and got some information back from, uh, I'm not being paid for this, from HackerOne, BugCrowd, and, and Cobalt. And uh, HackerOne actually pointed me to a, a stat that 94%, 94% of the Forbes 1000 actually have no vulnerability disclosure program uh, defined. So uh, ripe, for, ripe for some fun stuff to happen there. So let, let's get started. Uh, I'm not going to go into the definition of what a bug bounty is, but it, I think a couple more interesting points that might be worth calling out. So uh, when, when do you think the first payout for a, a hack or a, a, a bug bounty was? Any ideas? 1800s, 1900s? <laughs> um, uh, Charles Alfred Hobbs actually cracked a physical lock back in 1851, I think he got paid 200 gold guineas, equivalent to $20,000 today for, for picking that lock, evidently. A um, couple more interesting things here. I, I guess everybody knows Facebook and Mozilla and Google and Microsoft all run bounties. Um, I was going to share some stats. What I'll do instead of wasting time here, I'll, I'll actually post these as part of a recap that I'll do uh, with this. Um, I'm trying to think if there's an in another interesting thing here. In terms of payouts, um, what do you think one of the most interesting payouts might be? Nobody's going to guess, of course. So Slack, a million dollars, that would be nice. Uh, Slack actually paid $12.50 for a, a bug where an emoji was described as being a cheeseburger and it was actually a hamburger or vice versa. 
So they, they, they chose to pay. They chose to pay that uh, that bug submission twelve fifty the cost of a hamburger or a cheeseburger, evidently. So, and one other interesting point before I get to the panel uh, is the we obviously see a lot of momentum in the traditional technical vulnerability research community driven bug bounties. But I read this morning, in fact, that Facebook is now extending that same model to their ad platform. And so now they're crowdsourcing the ads and, and communications on, their, on Facebook to look for ways or look, misuse and abuse of, of the platform in that way. So kind of interesting. So gentlemen, we're on to you now, finally. Um, I, I'd like to maybe briefly discuss uh, the differences uh, of the different types of bug bounties that there are and maybe the value of some versus others and, and, and uh, where companies are having most success. We're looking at closed versus open, public versus private, um, uh, yeah, internal versus external, uh, let's see, uh, public disclosure versus non-disclosure, and uh, how that relates to hybrid pen testing as well, perhaps. So, Michael, I'll actually start with you. Your experience at PayPal, if you would, please. Okay, so there's a lot there, obviously. So, uh, start with... Let's go with public-private. Public-private. So, I would define public... There's a lot of different definitions. So, I would suggest that the difference between a public and a private is whether or not you want to allow someone to publicly disclose. And maybe even throw in, are you going to vet the individual researchers or not? So obviously there's pluses and minuses to both situations. So let's go with the vetting first. If you want to vet your researchers and you know, make them almost apply to be part of your program, that's fantastic. You're gonna have higher quality researchers, no doubt about it. The negative side to that is you're limiting your scope. So if somebody doesn't meet your requirements to get in and they find something, are you going to have an avenue for them to disclose? The secondary part of the public versus private, I would suggest, has to do whether or not you're going to allow them to go public when they have a finding. There are two key um, motivations, I think. There's, there's certainly more than two, but there's two key motivations for researchers. One is fame, and the other is fortune. So are you going to pay them? A lot of people absolutely want payment for, vulner for vulnerabilities. But the other piece of the puzzle, that fame, so a lot of people, PhD students would be a good example, um, very high level hackers, they're actually more concerned about getting credit for that particular finding than they are the payment itself. And so if you restrict that and you say, well, you can be part of our program, but we're not going to allow you to disclose that, again, you're only gonna get a subset of this whole research community. So those are those two big pieces of the puzzle. I'm actually going to look to, to Sean, your, your perspective on that, maybe leading off of what Michael described. <laughs> um, so I would, um, when a company's about to start a bug bounty program, I always recommend starting private, um, doing a small uh, pool of vetted researchers, HackerOne, BugCrowd, Synac. Um, you can all go to them and they can recommend their top hackers for, say it's a mobile application or infrastructure or web app. Um, and you can start there, figure out how your uh, internal company is going to be able to uh, mitigate bugs, resolve them. Um, figure out where your bottlenecks are, see if you need to hire on more internal people. Um, so I always recommend starting private and small. Then as that, once you figure out, uh, you, get, you work through all those nuances, then you can expand either the scope, the researcher pool or bounties, um, and then eventually go public if you, uh, if you uh, want to do that. Yeah, I would make an analogy with uh, the you know, adoption of static code analysis that a lot of companies actually have gone through. And uh, whenever you start, you think you have, you know, uh, already, you know, secure code in place and you are doing everything that you should and then you run on a few tool, those tools and suddenly you find a bunch of vulnerabilities. Same thing happens with uh, a bug bounty program. You think you're doing a good job, you think you're ready, but guess what? The number of vulnerabilities that you get can be overwhelming. And uh, not only the, you know, uh, true positives, but also the duplicates that you get. So having this structure also to be able to respond is really important. One of the things that the researchers, either private or public, they want to have is uh, respect. So you should be on top of things. You should be properly staffed. You should be thinking about the consequences of op uh, opening up this thing. So starting with a private program is actually uh, probably the better choice to start with a very narrow scope 
so you can actually have a successful program. You can get good quality uh, uh, submissions and then start expanding once this you know, initial experiment is already in place. And Mike, I know you get a lot of requests, um, maybe after the fact, of a researcher coming. Um, what can you tell our, our folks listening here uh, with respect to how to approach uh, starting a program? Uh, well, you know, I, I think one of, the, one of the biggest risks when you start a program, it kind of touches upon what Casio just said. Um, you know, when you, when you start publicly and you're getting a lot of uh, vulnerability reports in, there's going to be a question as to whether the company has the proper resources and procedures in place to vet, investigate, and remediate those vulnerabilities. And part of it comes down to a constructive knowledge issue because even though the right people in the company may not know that those vulnerabilities exist, somewhere in the company now they've been reported and that creates additional liability for the company if there is some um, you know, malicious activity that, that, that uh, um, t takes advantage of that vulnerability and causes some harm to some, the company or third parties or customers it can definitely increase liability for the company um, if you open it up publicly. So I think from a, from a, a legal perspective, the private, um, starting privately, makes a lot of sense. And there's also an issue with respect to what, what Michael touched upon uh, in connection with the, um, the private versus public programs and, and knowing the identity of your researchers. Um, there will be many opportunities where um, you, you, you'll want to keep that vulnerability secret. And not only that, occasionally researchers do get access to, uh, inadvertently, confidential information of the company. And at least knowing the identity of the researcher makes it easy, much easier, to uh, enforce those confidentiality agreements that you might have in place with the individual. So one could argue that the best way to keep those vulnerabilities secret is to not open it up anywhere and just hold everything internally. And I think traditionally that's that's where companies have invested, right? Do pen tests and, and whatnot. So maybe, Michael, if you could maybe paint a picture for us of how a bug bounty program, either private or public, fits into uh, an application security program overall. So if you view your application security program as the secure product life cycle, so you have all of these controls put in place up until the point where you get to live production level code. Um, all that stuff would be obviously different. But once you've gone live and you have production code, there's a number of different techniques you can find to define vulnerabilities. So obviously continuous scanning. I believe our, the previous presenter talked a lot about dynamic scanning and some of the pros and cons. Um, obviously, you're only going to find certain classes of vulnerabilities. It's not going to be very effective for finding business logic type errors. Um, the second, I think, most effective control would probably be a penetration test. So this would be time boxed. It's usually limited in scope as far as it's either one person or three people or a small team uh, performing that time box test. That will be limited mainly by the time. So you're going to have a methodology and a scope and you're going to allow these penetration testers to go as far as they can based upon those limitations. And then you know, the most effective control is really bug bounty. You now have the entire research community, all the time in the world. Um, you're still going to probably have some pretty legitimate limitations. You're not going to want them to do scanning on your production code and, and certain things like that, but you will find a lot of effective vulnerabilities. So those three combined, I think, are a majority of the, the avenues. Um, there's certainly some subsets and, and hybrids. I know Synac was already mentioned, they like to do time box bug bounties, which would be another way of talking about a penetration test, because it's time boxed. So there's a, there's a lot of different <coughs> hybrids. And you didn't say the word scoping, but you, you kind of touched on it there. Um, maybe Casio, if you can kind of define what scoping is and how important it is uh, when defining a bug bounty. Yeah, so um, it, that's something that uh, all companies have to think about is, uh, what is open for bug bounty, right? Uh, if you have, for example, a new acquisition, you might not want to open. Uh, some types of applications might not make a lot of sense to also, um, you know, uh, open up for, for scope and, you know, let uh, other uh, researchers go and try to find vulnerability, uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, one of the things about 
the uh, life cycle that Michael was talking that I think it's uh, pretty important too is that as software becomes part of everything that we, we have and we do, uh, the scope of uh, what should be done in the life cycle is also expanding, right? Uh, before we start seeing things such as Microsoft STL, which you know tells you, okay, there's you know architectural reviews, code reviews, testing, and you get up to a point where you have deployment, and there's very little about uh, the end of life cycle of a application, as well as you know the possibility that an application will most likely be exploited. And when an application is exploited, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that uh, come out uh, after that, such as incident response and so on. So having a um, bug bounty program in place uh, is becoming a trend. It's really becoming part of the development life cycle for every application. And I believe in the future, if uh, you know, companies don't have that in place, there will be consequences when they have litigations and, and, and other things going on. So hopefully the, those mm -hmm. decisions on what's in or out are defined by risk. Yes. Um, but I'm going to look to Sean. Uh, what types of programs get you excited as a researcher? Right? So what, what things that uh -huh. fall into scope excite you? Uh, the, bigger, the bigger the scope, the better. Um, more attack surface, more stuff for me to look at. Um, say everything's in scope, I can perform full recon, figure out their external footprint, or certain apps are in scope, I might focus on the bigger ones, because if you go after their core applications, the, co the company's gonna pay more for a bug. They might pay, say, $100 for a cross scripting on one site, but like 2,000 on another one, if it's their core main site. Um, so bigger the scope, the better. It can, you can invest a lot more time, um, see where a company has their assets. Are they global, or are they just in the US? Um, it's, it's always fun uh, when you get a, a really big scope because you can uh, uh, report a lot of bugs and make a lot of money. <laughs> Sean touched on global versus U.S. I don't know if you how many thoughts on that with respect to companies operating in the U.S. versus globally and, and how the legal risk changes by opening up things. Well, you know, I, I think some of that's really going to depend on uh, the types of you know, anti-hacking laws that you find in certain countries. I think the issue with scope, you mentioned having a, you, you, you like to have a, a larger scope. Um, I think it's incredibly important for a company, if, if they do have a larger scope, to have a clearly defined scope. Because at least in the United States, we have laws like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and similar laws that will criminalize uh, intentionally exceeding access to a protected computer. And what's a protected computer in the United States? It's really any computer interfacting commerce, right? Which is any business computer. So if, if, if you have a, a poorly defined scope, uh, you can waive certain rights to, to take legal action against someone who is engaging in malicious conduct. Or you can give that person a defense that, hey, this conduct that I engaged in, even though it was harmful, it was okay, you allowed me to do it. You know, there are countries you know, outside the United States that certainly have laws that are very similar. And if you don't have a clearly defined scope, um, you raise the same risk. And we, when we were talking last night, we, we touched on this idea of, of um, bringing that discussion through uh, a law firm, such that those the findings of the, the of the issues uh, by the researchers are then communicated under uh, client attorney privilege. privilege. Well, it, it wouldn't be the communications of the, the, the researcher that would be protected by attorney. So, so what, the, the issue here is uh, to the extent that the company discovers some vulnerability and it poses some risk to the company, um, how does the company communicate that internally and try to address it? And if it looks like it could be an issue that can raise the specter of litigation in any sense, um, you know, it might be a, a good idea to involve in-house counsel in those communications to, 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 to think about whether there are any of these internal uh, company c communications that you want to assert attorney-client privilege over that you would then uh, not produce in the event of litigation against the company if it involved some sort of, um, you know, issue stemming out of that vulnerability. Michael, I won't ask you to necessarily uh, make a statement on whether or not you use uh, counsel to manage this stuff, but what are some of the other parts of the organization that are involved in, in helping you organize and, and ensure that your bug bounty programs are successful? Surprisingly, it's, it's really practically everyone in the company. So 
there's certain pieces of the puzzle that are, it's really important that you have lined up before you try and start one. The whole product development community needs to understand your bug bounty program. There's so many gray lines. Um, oftentimes, a researcher is going to come in with a vulnerability. They're going to inflate the risk, and then you're going to send that to product development, and they're going to say, I don't think that this is a big deal at all. I don't want to fix it. And so you have to play kind of this intermediary whereby you can help kind of pave the path where everybody is satisfied. And oftentimes that's very difficult. So all of product development will be one group. Communications, obviously. Every time you send an email to somebody who's a researcher, that could go public on social media. So you have to have your predefined, um, hate to say canned responses, because I think researchers as a whole would much prefer not a canned response, so a little bit of um, specifics as to their specific submission. Obviously legal, um, IR, was another one that was brought up. So it's really everybody in the company needs to buy in and kind of agree to this common set of rules that you're going to play by before you want to get too involved with this. Cassie, do, do you see this as a, as a board level topic yet? Um, it, it depends on the company. It, it really depends, uh, you know, for tech companies, for example, uh, it, it can get to, to a board level. But for other companies, still, you know, uh, in other industries, still in, in its infancy. Uh, one interesting thing about uh, the different types of bug bounties is that you can also have your own instead of working with a company. They specialize on that, right? And when you're talking with the uh, researchers, I think when you are uh, using a company to handle your bug bounty program, you have more leverage when you say, "Hey, this is going to take a little bit longer to fix." than if you're doing by yourself, right? Because there's so much you can say or can, you know, talk to them, otherwise they, you know, burn bridges with you or the, the bug bounty company, which is kind of interesting. In the case of PayPal, I believe you guys are doing your own uh, program, right? That's correct. Yeah. And I'm, let's spend a little more time on the, the SDLC and, and mm -hmm. the development team um, and their relationship with the owner of the program. Is it? Is it, does it live within R&D? Is it a separate team that works alongside? Is it part of the overall InfoSec group? Where, where do we see this fitting? It's, it's really, I, I believe it's a security initiative, but really you, you need the buy-off of a lot of people, such as legal, especially DAV, right? Because if you have a wonderful program that people are actually submitting things and you don't have uh, the fixes coming out, uh, as Michael said, you're, you're building a vulnerability. You have a database of vulnerabilities, uh, of liabilities, right? Uh, things that you know they're bad and they're just sitting there and people told you they're bad. And if they are actually exploited, then you know you, you might have some big problems if you ever go to court for, for that. So that's an important point. And as a researcher, Sean, do you care if they ever fix them or you just want to get paid? <laughs> um, if the fix takes longer than what it should, as long as the company conveys that or keeps up constant communication st stating this is going to take a little bit longer. Um, I I've worked for a company that's had vulnerabilities and I've reported vulnerabilities, so I understand that certain things can take longer. If it's, vaca if it, if it's around Christmas time or holidays, people are going to be out of the office. Um, you're not exactly going to want or going to have uh, a fix <laughs> that day or um, that week. Um, so it, you just kind of have to build expectations with the researcher, let them know, it, um, maybe set up 90 day limit. Um, if it's a really critical one, just reach out, let them know, it might take a little bit longer. Um, it's just all about communication. Just can talk to the researcher, try to be as open without sharing too much information. Um, they'll appreciate that. Yeah. And, yeah, go ahead. Go, going back to the point of uh, fortune or fame, Mm -hmm. uh, one important topic is when the researchers get paid, mm -hmm. right? And there are two uh, uh, views on this. One is should be paid when it's you know found and confirmed, and then the person actually sometimes go and say, "Hey, I will disengage. I got my you know bounty, and I'll let the company deal with the vulnerability." The other one is no, we're going to wait until it's fixed because we want the researcher engaged so that the person can validate the vulnerability for, for us and make sure that it was properly fixed and we don't have recurring findings of the same vulnerability. Just two different uh, uh, of point of views, but one of them, you can also have the problem of uh, taking too long to fix 
in the end, the researcher going public, you know, and say, hey, you know, I reported this thing and I didn't get paid, and you know, they they're just sitting on the vulnerability. Yeah, and to me, there are two parts to that, right? So there's the don't disclose it before it's fixed, and then there's help validating. So yes. I can I can see the first one, the researcher, and maybe Sean, you can confirm, but I'm fine to wait to not disclose. You tell me when it's fixed, that's fine. But do you, Sean, do you feel that it's appropriate to request uh, confirmation or validation that the fix is in place before you get paid? Um, so there's different ways of going about this. Some companies will pay their minimum bounty on triage, and triage means the vulnerability has been accepted as, it, as valid. It is a bug. They acknowledge that it's an issue. So they may pay a minimum bounty, say 200 bucks or $500, depending on what their minimum bounty is. Um, and then that, that kind of like will uh, extend the researcher's expectations on when it, the bug will be fixed and fully paid out, and then do the complete payment on resolution of the bug. And that may take a month. Um, I've waited two years for bugs before to be fixed. So that can be <laughs> a little bit uh, um, of a pain, but uh, it's, it's always nice when a company does pay a little bit up front, just say, hey, we acknowledge it. Here's, thanks for your efforts. We're going to pay the rest when this is all done. I think PayPal does um, something of that sort. You do 50 up front and 50 at the end percent. Yeah. yeah. And at the end of the day, this is really important because basically when you're dealing with crowdsourcing, it's, you know, for example, uh, the experience with uh, Uber and Lyft, most of the drivers will drive for both, right? So if you have a program that really is paying and recognizing and uh, really giving the respect that researchers should be receiving, uh, chances are the research will, you know, continue to work with the company instead of just moving to some you know, other bug bounty. So I think that's, that's a really important point. And you're, a few of you have touched on uh, expectations, and it's important to set expectations, not just for the researcher, of course, but uh, also internally uh, for the engineering team and perhaps within the organization of if we actually do find this thing that we've committed $250,000 to as a payout, <laughs> right? we're going to pay it. So. Uh, Mike, I don't know if you have any. Well, well I, you know, I, I think good practice when you're drafting your bug bounty terms and conditions is to never promise you're going to make any payment. You know, just don't make promises you're going to make payments because if you have a dispute, um, you know, you can you can have claims for uh, you know sort of bogus vulnerabilities, right? Where the where the where the researcher and the company just have a disagreement on whether it, it's it's a real vulnerability or not. Um, you know, most of the of the good bug bounty program terms, they, they don't promise to pay. They instead they, they they'll give a payment range, and they, they say it's you know we'll make a payment in our sole and absolute discretion. Um, and the the company, if they if they do make payments, then they'll get a reputation as a company that makes payments, and the, and they make payments within some given range, so that the, the that researchers know what to expect. And do you sign up for the ones that don't? promise to pay? <laughs> um, if a company <laughs> was really ambiguous about it, I'd probably stay away from that just because it would, I don't know if it'd be worth my time to uh, invest any time in the company if they weren't saying they were going to pay me any money, if it was just open-ended like that. Um, you can set uh, scope guidelines and say, these issues are out of scope. We're not going to pay for these lower uh, severity issues or issues that don't necessarily affect our like major platform. Um, and you can say, we only pay for these types of issues. And you can set those explicitly up front. So if it is a valid issue, the company does acknowledge it, then they will pay for it. And in that case, then I would definitely um, look at the company and try to submit bugs to it. And if they, so to, to Mike's point, though, I guess if, if they have a record or track record of paying, uh, yeah, would that, would, yeah, that would change that. your mind? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shifting back internally, what? What kind of expectations need to be set for development or the rest of the organization? Um, measuring the severity, time to fix, that kind of stuff. How do you, how do you deal with those communications and expectation settings? I don't know, Michael or Cassio? Michael. Well, let me jump in first. Yeah, so there, there's two major things that I like to really focus on, and it goes both to researchers and up to product development. It's transparency and consistency. So if you have a consistent and transparent way of defining risk, and with that definition goes a service level agreement for the quantity of time that we're going to allow them to fix the vulnerability, that goes a long ways. So that has to be agreed upon because obviously product development, their primary focus is innovation. 
they're going to see fixing security vulnerabilities as is something that takes away from their bonuses and, and their internal goals. So as long as you have that defined up front and you're consistent and transparent, then it's just really a matter of helping them, you know, be there, support them. A lot of times they're not going to know how to fix something correctly. A lot of times what they're going to do is they're going to come up with some kind of really poor fix for a vulnerability instead of correctly doing it. So I would suggest that um, just really concentrate on, on those two key attributes and you'll probably be pretty fine. Yeah, defining the type of vulnerabilities that uh, you want to find is really important, right? And uh, hopefully you, you're defining by the, the consequences of the exploitation, right? Instead of just saying, you know, SQL injection or something like that. Uh, so that people know exactly what uh, you're looking for, what's in scope and what's out of sco uh, scope and, you know, uh, what, what should be the, the focus of the, the program. Uh, likewise, from the researcher side, I think consistency is very important. I've seen programs where they have, uh, uh, you know, it's a private program, people are invited, and the way to be kicked out of the program is by uh, submitting a lot of noise. And I think that's a, a great thing to write, it, which is, okay, if you don't submit for a long time, but you actually submitted good things in the past, you were there, you're going to be notified about, you know, new programs, you're going to be invited. But if you start just submitting, you know, noise, we're going to kick you out. So it's consistency in both sides. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious to I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. Uh, so some of them have bug bounties running, uh, companies that are considering them. What attributes uh, of a company make them ripe for uh, pursuing a bug bounty program. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause while I pose that question. I'm going to say, anybody in the audience that has a question for the panel, please don't wait for me to say, and please use the mic. So Martin will find you, raise your hand, and, and ask your question. So maybe, uh, Mike, if you can start us off, a few attributes of what makes a company ripe for running yeah, a bug bounty. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there are a few attributes that necessarily make a company right. I, I think there might be some attributes that make a company not right, um, looking at it another way. Um, you know, I, I think if, you're, um, you know, if you provide products or, or services that are part of the critical in infrastructure of the United States, for example, and you're, if you're in the nuclear power industry, uh, you may not want to open up your nuclear power plant to a bug bounty program. So I have a question in regard to public versus private and the disclosure. Um, just comments on how you feel that affects the community as a whole. I mean, we're here at OWASP, right? Just sharing vulnerabilities, sharing knowledge. Um, if you keep that tight and close and, and you keep all that restricted, um, let's look, look at, you know, Equifax. Had that, th that was known, CVEs, maybe they didn't do their due diligence or due care. But let's say it was a zero day. We find it first. We don't share that information with the community. Just any thoughts on that? Um, Let's take it. Let me jump in then. So I think Bug Bounty actually is a very positive way to interact with the greater community. Um, it's, it's, clear, it's clear that we try, that there's like this initial feeling, like I want to hold my own vulnerabilities close to the vest, right? Like it's uncomfortable. And sometimes for the betterment of the community, it's okay to express that uncomfortable feeling. For example, you know, a lot of uh, PayPal allows developers to blog about their findings after it, the vulnerability has been fixed. And I think that's really good. There's a good cadence there, right? We, we say that, okay, we'll partner with you on this communication and it's gonna go something like this. You know, you submitted something to us, we validated it, we fixed it, we paid a righteous bounty. And together, the research community and PayPal are striving to make our users as safe as possible. So there, there's that end. And then again, like the advancement of the community, if you can figure out that the Struts Vuln had another uh, header that was vulnerable that wasn't part of the CVE, by, by disclosing that information, you're now you know, enabling people to be safer. So I think that's a huge piece of the puzzle. Um, also, as far as sharing information um, like bugs, you could redact everything that has to do with the company and just talk about the concept or give uh, requests and responses that 
totally redact everything about the company. So it could just be an example of a bug, and then people could use that to um, kind of almost like a learning tool. So I'll, I'll post on my blog different bugs that I find. Some are on private programs. However, you'll never be able to tell what the program was because I've redacted all the information that's identifying of the company. Um, so it's, it's always nice when people do share that information because it gives you, uh, it can sometimes present a different viewpoint on how to find a bug or how to approach a, a website or a system. Um, so it can be helpful, definitely. I, uh, I always love it when, when I get to read another person's bug report. Um, I, just, I just sit down, I'll read through it all, read it twice, three times. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. So. And you learn, you learn from reading those? Oh, de too. definitely. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, is this, yeah. Uh, what would you say are the main uh, advantages or disadvantages of using a bug bounty platform versus doing it all on your own? So there, there's definitely one key advantage to using a platform, right? All that infrastructure you don't need to create on your own. There's one main disadvantage, and that is you don't really have that interpersonal relationship with the researchers themselves. Like, that, that's actually a huge piece of the puzzle. One of my biggest fears about using a platform is false negatives. There's a lot of submissions that will come in, and we'll look at it and we'll say, oh, well, the way that submission is written, that's actually a false. You know, that, that's not a real vulnerability. But as you start digging in, it will point to some real significant problems. You know, and, and to me, that's worth its weight in gold. Like, I will definitely pay a researcher, even though he, what he defined isn't accurate, if, in fact, it you know, was the start of something that was significant and we made a lot of changes to a, a piece of the puzzle. So my view is that uh, big companies such as PayPal, they, they have the expertise and they have the people in order to make this possible, right? While some uh, smaller companies might have the willingness to do it, but they don't have the people. Uh, even the uh, false positive triage, sometimes false positives also means duplicates. And that's something that a company you know, uh, can actually do for you using their people. And then you, you get the benefits. And uh, you know, if, it is, if there are like glaring vulnerabilities in the application, they're going to be found like several you know, times. So getting that filter right there is already you know, something that uh, has its value. Uh, in addition, there is the uh, questions of, uh, you know, making payments sometimes to, you know, foreign countries. For some companies, it might be very easy, right? For some other companies, it might be a, a lot more difficult. Uh, language barriers, you know, they might help you with that. So there, there's some uh, uh, advantages, as well as uh, how to deal with researchers. Uh, some companies, such as, you know, the Microsoft, the semantics of the world, they have people who have relationships and they know how to deal with uh, the, the finders. Some others don't have or, or they don't even know how you know, this, this different world actually works. And when they're dealing with a bug bounty uh, uh, program, they actually have the, the relationship with the entire you know, program that is not only offered by one company, but several other companies. So you know, uh, if they burn bridges, they might not be able to work with a number of uh, opportunities right there so and, and I think adding to that when you use a platform you can you can push some of the legal risk of running a bug bounty program yes. onto a third party so yeah. I'll just give you an example a sanctions laws uh, you know there could be many people that are on uh, the, the US government office of foreign asset control keeps a denied parties list um, th those are individuals they could be terrorists who knows who they are right um, that companies in the United States shouldn't do business with. You shouldn't make payments to these individuals. And if, if you use a platform, it's, it's the platform's responsibility to make sure that it's complying with those laws. Yeah. Let me jump in on false positives real fast. Mm -hmm. So I've seen other external companies post false positive rates, and I think ours is very similar. So that's about 60%. So that's yeah. a lot of noise. Another 20% are probably really low risk. So by having some kind of third party do this for you, you could only you know, have about 20% of total submissions get to you. So that's a lot of work. So they, they're definitely going to solve a problem there. I, I think one thing that was touched on was uh, there's private, per or I'm sorry, there's platforms, then you can run your own, and then there's managed versus unmanaged. So you could use HackerOne or BugCrowd and not have a third party triaging your bugs and giving you false negatives. So you could use the HackerOne platform have your own team on there, you'd still get the same 
uh, same, same amount of bug reports as you would as you were to run your own one. Right. Uh, the thing that I like about using a platform such as HackerOne or BugCrowd or Synac, um, you can log into one portal. I can have three companies sending me back information, asking for additional information or to uh, validate if a bug is fixed, and I don't have to go to three different sites to do that. So that's one thing that I appreciate as a researcher. If they're on oh, a like a, a platform such as HackerOne, I can just log in there, do all my bugs, sign out, and I'm done. So. So you become more efficient, basically. Yeah. yeah. And I was curious, um, when you find something, let's say, in a public program and you're researching in a private program and in similar code, perhaps, do you find that your findings translate or transfer between programs? If you find something in a, like, say, a CMS or something that's used widely, like a, a plugin on certain sites, you could, <laughs> what I would do is report to one program and then report to all the other ones as well um, if you find something cool like that. Because um, the, the, the companies may or may not pay out for it. Some of them have scope guidelines saying if it's a zero day vulnerability, we need 30 days to remediate these before we'll um, pay out for a bug. So once that 30 day period expires and the uh, CVE has been no, like, notified or published, um, then you can go and report it. Uh, it all depends on what the, co the companies are willing to pay for. Some are more uh, lenient on that side, some are more strict, so you just have to um, uh, figure out what those companies are if, if you want to do that. WordPress. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't touch on payment. Um, I have a few minutes left. On anybody have any burning desire to talk about how to set payments? Or? So payments for me is a very difficult space because no two vulns are really alike. So there's this urge to say, okay, it's cross-site scripting, so we're gonna pay $1,000. But then when you really start digging in, if you have any sort of size to your enterprise, you're gonna find out that one cross-site scripting may have actually very limited risk and another may have actually very significant risk. Maybe it might lead to a, like an account takeover, for instance. So I think we have evolved from that type-based payment system to more of a risk-based payment system. So let me, and a lot of um, like penetration testing companies, for example, really push back on this. Like I want to have some kind of framework, like CVSS as an example, to define my risk to the research community. Um, that will then allow me to closely tie in the payments to that. So I can say the 6.0, okay, other 6.0s, we paid 3,000, so that makes sense to this one as well, and then just pay the researcher. That's part of that consistency piece that I mentioned earlier. So. Yeah, and, and I think that's a very good point. Uh, our industry is really good at risk assessment, but not at risk quantification, right? We don't know how to express things in dollar values. And I think we're just in the infancy when we started Bug Bounty to say, yeah, there's actually a value for this kind of research, which in the past we used to say people are trying to hack our website or, you know, and so on. And uh, there's going to be a lot more coming up in this space on, okay, what's the value of this, you know, finding? What's the value of this research? And it's not going to be expressed just by saying it's a cross-site scripting or it's a SQL injection, just like Michael said. I think the payments can all depend on your scope. Um, if it's a single application, um, the cross-site scriptings are probably going to be the same. Depending if they're stored or reflected, you can pay a different amount for that. Um, but if your scope's super wide, you could set an expectation that we will pay up to X amount for a bug. Um, and up to means you could pay way less than that if you wanted to. Um, so that's one way of going about it. Uh, and you can also have uh, exceptions as well. If someone submits a really awesome cross-site scripting that's wormable to go through a website and do a bunch of bad things, um, you could always pay a bonus on that. So you could say we pay up to $3,000 for cross-site scripting, but if you get an awesome report, you could double that if you wanted to. It's up to the discretion of the company. But setting some type of expectations nice mm -hmm. as a researcher, you know, I'm, the max I'm going to get possibly is this, the, and it's going to be ar around there, hopefully, depending if the company's um, abiding by what they're, what they're stating. Perfect. And we have one more quick question from another yeah. Los Angeles um, contingent. Thank you so much, guys. It's a great panel discussion. Um, is there any advice or best practices that you can share about how to deal with an unethical behavior of the researchers? That is so hard. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom line is, is if you have production code, you're going to be hit by everybody. So, you know, a lot of people think that, oh, people who 
participate in bug bounty, they're the white hats. And the rest of the bad guys, they're black hats, but they wouldn't actually participate, right? They're going to exploit and, and run with that exploit. I would suggest that with any large community of people, you're going to have everybody in between, right? And so people are going to abuse your site, and there's no doubt about it. And people are going to do things. I mean, we explicitly, as an example, prohibit any kind of scanning. But yet, submissions will come in. Hey, look at my SQL map results, right? And so you have to deal with that. But if you're, the one thing that I try not to do is, is well, let's just ban them, right? Let's just ban everybody who doesn't participate. Well, if you ban everybody, are you, are you unwilling to bend a little bit? Then your, your program, you're going to miss out on a lot of volumes, right? Now the black cats only have one direction to go, and that's to, again, sell it on the dark web or whatever. So my advice would be, don't be too firm, but then don't be too lax. Like, try and work with them, try and educate them, give warnings before you have to do something serious like a banning. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, putting money and uh, a dollar next to a, a vulnerability is actually kind of also the root of all evil, right? So I've seen different ways of handling that. Uh, for example, I believe uh, Alex Tamos on Facebook actually called somebody publicly because one of the researchers was actually finding vulnerabilities on Facebook, but also the guy held back uh, one of the vulnerabilities so that he could have access to internal resources on Facebook and actually use that to probe and find other vulnerabilities. So he said, hey, I, I don't think this is ethical, right? Uh, also, sometimes the, the bounty is so, um, so high that for other countries, when you have developer you know, overseas, it makes sense for the developer to actually inject a vulnerability and then tip somebody else, right? Hey, let me tip my cousin, and then the person is going to report. So background checks are also very uh, important. And quite frankly, some programs, you know, the, the payout of uh, the vulnerability is so big that they are not going to report the bounty. In my opinion, the biggest uh, bug bounty out there is uh, Bitcoin. They don't have a bug bounty. Right? But if you find a vulnerability, you can make a couple million dollars by not reporting anything. Right? So what is going to make somebody go and say, hey, there's a serious vulnerability on this you know, a cryptocurrency system if they are going to you know, get the money? So a couple of things to consider. Um, yeah, I would recommend warning a researcher if they were being unethical um, and just telling them we're either going to dock your next bounty or we're going to ban you or something like that. Or if they're being extremely unethical, then I would <laughs> definitely uh, ban them. But uh, most of the time, the researching community, as long as you are upfront with them and you communicate well, um, you're hopefully not going to run into issues like that. Um, but there are, there are always outliers. Um, so I would give them warnings, mostly. Perfect. I think we're right at the time, if I'm not mistaken. I was hoping to have the, these four gentlemen give a final thought. If everybody's okay, giving them a couple minutes more, that's all right. Mike, if I could start with you, just a final thought. A gotcha, uh, be yeah, sure no, to... I, I think that bug bounty programs are definitely, a, uh, there's a trend in the industry towards them. And, uh, you know, I, I think in many circumstances they make a lot of sense. You know, they, they don't come without additional risk to the company, but you know, there are certainly ways uh, that the company can mitigate risk, especially by having good resources in place, um, a program uh, with, an, with internal procedures that are actually followed and understanding of how vulnerabilities are, are remediated once they're reported, and just having good program terms and conditions that are very clear uh, for the company. Um, yeah, bug bounties are a great way to augment your uh, current security practices, good way to test your blue team. Um, and if you're thinking about starting bug bounty, you should invite me. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as they, you know, uh, they, they said, it's absolutely a trend. And uh, yes, while there's some industry that are not going to be a good fit for bug bounty, right? You're not doing, you're going to do with a nuclear power plant. Uh, I see a lot of times, for example, finance industry saying, "Hey, we shouldn't be doing this." And then you have PayPal with like award-winning type of uh, programs that is doing and doing really well. So you know, time to really, really think again, and and see if you know um, your industry should be doing this, and your you know company should be doing. So final thought, um, definitely get alignment from everybody in your organization. It's, it's very important that you're all working together for finding and fixing these vulnerabilities. 
I would also suggest if you manage one, it's, it's really awesome because the research community is full of some really smart people. And you can read books and you can you know, take training, but you will learn more in a bug bounty program than all those combined. The, the submissions are just fantastic, so. Perfect, well thanks gentlemen. I'll, uh, one, one final thought for me if everybody's okay. So I'll summarize by saying determine the best model Use a risk-based program, make sure the right people are involved, set ex expectation, and manage communications well. And uh, you're off on the right foot. What do you think? Yes, very well said. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, sticking with us. Appreciate it.